So just tipped over 5 million views for the Star Beast. Wild Blue Yonder lost 200,000 people, 4.83, and lost another 200. Yep, 4%. 1,000 people with 4.62. Fails to mention that though. Even the dwindling numbers. I don't fail to. I, I mentioned that later on in the video. <laughs> Over the seven days. It's such a cope. I will say, I am genuinely quite surprised that there was a drop with every single episode. Now, I thought that Wild Blue Yonder. Why was there a surprise? Why is there a surprise? <laughs> He's just not going to mention it. He's like, oh, he doesn't bring that up. He never mentions that there's a drop. Never mentioned that. And then the next literal sentence he plays is me mentioning it. And he's just like, yeah, but why was there a drop? Like, he doesn't even acknowledge that he was wrong. And this was an edited video. This is edited. This isn't a live stream. This is back to back. And he just left it in. He left it in. <laughs> a few moments later. They're losing people by the millions because people have had enough of this bullshit they just want to be entertained they're going over they're going over international waters they're going to japanese entertainment to actually be entertained by people yes they're going to watch japanese entertainment famously a political japanese entertainment what are some of the biggest exports happening from japan to the rest of the world right now anime and manga and let's not forget one piece literally an anime and a manga about revolutionaries trying to take down a world government which has a trans character a trans man in its latest arc its latest massive arc and it's had huge amounts of success the reason i'm not getting so triggered about doctor who anymore because i found a great show called one piece <laughs> does he know? How does he know? Let's take a look at my latest hit piece. Actually, I don't want to call it hit piece because well, actually, yeah, I do want to call it hit piece. I was going to say because we don't know what the content of the video itself is, but this is Melon Rattler who has titled a video, Doctor Who has a Mr. Retardist problem. What a great way to make a first impression to show that you've got good faith engagement with me or actual tangible issues to have by having an ableist slur in the chat and calling me a retard. Now, let's see what this person, gentleman, because of course it's going to be a guy, has to say. I'm going to do something different with this video because I'm very, very burnt out. I wanted to do a review on this episode until I actually watched it on Christmas Day. And unfortunately for myself, it was impossible to have any form of opinion on this kind of episode because nothing really happened. It was just a big meh. The only things that I can even recollect from this episode, because I refuse to go back and watch it for review purposes, is Shooty Gatua spinning around in a nightclub like a fucking fairy. A boring, impossible girl re cash storyline that we've seen a million times by now and a ch and for a show that's apparently been given a massive budget increase feels cheaper than ever so instead uh okay so obviously if you didn't like the christmas day special whatever that's fine it's subjective it's his prerogative whatever uh, i will say the doctor who supposedly having an enhanced budget is not going to be kicking in until series 14 proper so the 60th anniversary specials uh the star beast wild blue yonder the Giggle and Church on Ruby Road have not benefited from this increase in Disney funding. That's not happened yet. That's going to be series 14 onwards. So anyway. It was cheaper than ever. So instead, in this video, we're not going to be reviewing the episode. We're going to look, we're going to be looking at the fallout of this episode because it is probably a lot more interesting to talk about. Usually I can get angry and sit here and even talk to my friends about how much I hate the show and how much it winds me up. But now it's gotten to a point where... <laughs> sorry you think can you imagine like just being friends with this guy and it's like god's sake i just hate doctor who so because hate doctor because i just hate what they're doing like he was dancing around like a fucking fairy like obviously this guy is no fun at parties i can guarantee you that his friends are sick of him talking about doctor who there's nothing to f get mad about anymore because they had they've, they've won these weirdos have finally got the, the show they wanted this propaganda filled mess front line of the opposite opinion of this episode whereas i am in the camp of this is an absolute disgrace of an episode there are those that call this i mean i'm kind of waiting for him to actually substantiate his points here like i'm not really sure how the church on ruby road could be shown as propaganda in any way shape or form it was basically a apolitical fun fairy tale romp story with goblins and singing and you know 
you know, rescuing babies from churches and stuff. So I'm not, you know, obviously I'm not really sure what he's on about and I doubt he'll substantiate it, but anyway. It's an absolute win and an absolute triumph and we're the ones that are coping. So I want to have a quick... Matt G, you're, he does sound like Marvin the Paranoid Android in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed about the state of Doctor Who. Well, we've got something to set your mind off things. It won't work. I have an exceptionally melon-shaped mind look at someone called it looks like he's gonna break down crying oh yeah he, he does absolutely mainly because there was probably like black people or trans people in doctor who and that just makes him cry mr tardis and have a listen okay this is interesting because okay let's see if okay apparently i've blocked this guy if this screenshot is any indication does this guy okay there's no information does this guy have a twitter account davros is cancelled for sure special cringe starby's ratings bomb whatever um let's see is that any okay two seconds i'll see if i if i can find this guy's twitter account i have indeed blocked them it normally takes quite a lot for me to block people on social media so i'll be curious what it was that made me block him um it was him calling me a shill time and time again like i said that i liked wild blue yonder and he said god you're a fucking shill aren't you and then he also responded to me saying hell yeah i've made it because i was featured in an independent article about the Isaac Newton non-traversy. Uh, and he called me shield, so I just blocked him. Okay, to be fair, that was actually probably on the lower end of my threshold for reasons why I blocked someone. But anyway, now we know what this guy's... <laughs> now we know what this guy's origin story was. ...and of his evidence as to why this is apparently a success. And I we... mean, he didn't provide to me any evidence as to why I'm supposedly a shill, other than I liked something he doesn't like. So, you know... This guy doesn't really have a high burden of proof in any way, shape, or form. We are the ones that are wrong, and we are the system phobes. So let's just have a listen to some of his facts. And I say facts very loosely. Let's have a listen to this treacle's little fucking opinion, then. So there we go. This is... We are two minutes in. He has not actually put forward an argument. And he decides, okay, in order to show that I'm going to approach this topic maturely in good faith and just go over the facts and the logic or whatever, um, I'm just going to use an ableist slur in the video. No notes. 10 out of 10. So let's actually go in this with facts and logic and numbers. Aha, there's nothing sexier than charts and numbers. Oh, he just, he just already comes across like a complete fucking condescending little beta boy. He's had one too many. No, I'm not going to say it. We'll keep it. We'll keep it polite. Let's actually listen to his opinions and apparent facts that he's about to bring to the table. Numbers. So <laughs> he's so desperate to have a jab at me. He like I've not even actually said anything that bad yet. But he's so desperate to just sort of like get in there real quick, like a little like a little snide comment before the things even started. It's so funny. But we do have the seven day viewing figures for all three of the Doctor Who six. By the way, the seven day viewing figures that he is talking about, uh, they count a, what, 30 second viewing of the episode as an actual view. So, take that as you will. Do we count 30 seconds as an actual win for the viewing figure, or is it just... Okay, so I actually installed this brand new button on my streaming software over the Christmas period, and I didn't think I'd get a chance to use it this early on. Now, the... <laughs> you like that? You like, you like that? That was there real quick. So, the BARB and the BBC iPlayer viewing figures generally do not count one minute of content watched as a view. That's not how the BARB, that's not how the BBC iPlayer works. This guy does not cite a source for this, obviously, because he's wrong. I've spoken to many people who have worked in the BBC's digital department and the BARB puts their methodology on their website. But to surmise, like I mentioned earlier, the actual reasoning for the BARB is not for clout, it is not for point scoring, it is for industry leverage, it is for industry knowledge and insight so that people know what is being watched. The BBC is a public service broadcaster, so obviously it wants high viewing figures, but it also, as a public service broadcaster, wants to know what people are actually watching. It wants to know if people are watching something and actually sticking with it. It doesn't matter if a show is watched by 10 million people, but it's only watched by one minute. It's not something that will be worth investing in unless people stick around with it. The actual metric that I have been told from people within the BBC is that a 40% viewed video on the iPlayer counts as a view. 
you have to watch 40% of a program because, it's, you know, one minute doesn't really matter. Like if you have like an hour and a half TV movie, like an episode of Sherlock, for example, is a, is a 90 minute episode. If you compare one minute of that to one minute of CBB's bedtime stories, which is like six or seven minutes, for example, those are skewed metrics. You want a percentage of the actual content or the actual episode watch which is why the BBC and the BBI and the BARB, to my understanding, have settled on a 40% figure. So, in order for it to count as a view on these metrics, a program has to be watched by around 40% on iPlayer and on streaming. I don't know about Netflix, I don't know about Disney+, Plus. all I know is that's how the BBC iPlayer and the BARB works. A complete cope from the BBC, but yeah, you know, let's carry on. 60th anniversary specials, and for the third week in a row, Doctor Who was the number one most viewed drama of the week and also charted in the top 10, only behind the episodes of Strictly Come Dancing and I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here, meaning that it was kind of technically th uh, What he's failing to mention here already is that Doctor Who over the last three weeks, well, over the last three specials, should I say, lost viewers. And okay. Firstly, I didn't fail to mention it. I literally mention it in like 30 to 40 seconds time. In this very video, at least, I do mention the drop-off. It went from Star Beast to Wobbly Yonder was like a 4% drop, and then Wobbly Yonder to the Giggle was like another 4% drop. I mentioned that in this video that he's talking about. But also, how can I fail to mention it when I'm halfway through the sentence that I'm currently talking about? I've not omitted it, I just haven't gotten to that bit yet. Like I said, this guy is just so eager to sort of like jibe in and, and talk over or whatever that he's not actually listening to what I'm saying or engaging with the points. And couldn't even peak Peter Capaldi numbers. David Tennant peak was just over 5 million and over the one week period got 7 million fig figures, I'm pretty sure. F 7 million. Wait, you don't have the figures in front of you. Like, fair enough if you don't know them off the top of your head or if you've not memorized them by heart, but we're here talking about the viewing figures and you're not on camera, you are recording this. Do you not have them next to you on a note or in another tab? Why do you not have these figures in front of you if this is the basis of your argument? And even then, could again, could not match Peter Capaldi's worst viewing figures. So, you know what? Okay. This is the thing they keep coming back to is, oh, this is the fear. No, no okay, it's, if he had the figures in front of him, he'd know that that's not true. One thing I like about Wikipedia is that it does have the seven-day viewing figures on the episode list. So you can easily see it by going on Wikipedia. He said that the recent 60th anniversary specials were not as good as even the weakest Peter Capaldi stories. Okay, let's look at that. 7.61 million for the Star Beast. Let's go to the Peter Capaldi era. Remember, 7.61 million. And 7.61 million is better than every episode of series 10, barring the Christmas specials. Better than every episode of series 9, once again, barring the Christmas specials, and a few episodes of series 8, which was the post-50th anniversary series and one with a brand new Doctor. So, he, he's just fucking wrong. Like, you just look at the empirical, like, data, you just look at the figures here, like, black and white, clear as crystal, and he's here saying, oh, David Tennant with the Star Beast didn't even get as much as the worst of Capaldi. And here, we can see that he's bested the worst of, worst of Capaldi by around two to three million apiece. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm guessing that the Peter Capaldi era, nobody watched and people hated and was woke or stupid and what nonsense and propaganda or whatever. But, oh, oh, di oh my God. What a, he's, dude's an actual joke. And he, he, he has the tenacity to call me retardist. Come on. Good. Yeah, let's peer. We're not even peer reviewing. We're just looking at the numbers. This is like the bare minimum shit. Biggest viewing figures of the week. Oh, let's say the top three. Yeah, but no one's watching these fucking soap dramas anymore, mate. Because they're having the same criticisms as this kind of stuff is getting. It's all crap. No one's watching these channels anymore. People are going to other places to get their entertainment. Something he's failing to mention here. No, I, I don't fail. I, I mention all of this in the video, that the standards that we talk about, like TV viewership over the past few years has changed. And also when you compare other dramas and stuff, we've got Vigil, we've got Shetland and stuff like, I, what's so woke or what's so bad about all of those shows and all of those dramas? He's not going to name any specifics. Of course he's not. Like, of course he's not going to talk about them. Let's just carry on. <laughs> 
like he just fucking spotted out there was no argument there and even he had to acknowledge like in the actual video himself like he could have just like cut that ending bit out but he's so lazy that he didn't want to his argument completely feet like completely spotted and fizzled out listen no one's watching these channels anymore people are going to other places to get their entertainment something he's failing to mention here let's just carry on <laughs> he completely fizzles out he realizes mid-sentence he doesn't actually have a point and then thinks whatever let's carry on <laughs> third but if you want to call it ninth or tenth depending if, if it's the week of the wild blue yonder or star beast or uh, the giggle whatever works for you but it was indisputably the number one most viewed drama of the weeks that they were broadcast which honestly i don't think has happened since what 2011 2012 like it's kind of amazing w one thing we need to consider when 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 we talk about doctor who viewing figures will there be a pie chart unfortunately there will be no pie there will be plum pudding though but when it he could have he could have edited out the chimes of midnight reference when it comes to doctor who viewing figures what people need to understand is that even when doctor who was like at its peakest peak like winnie why are you so mad <laughs> winnie cameo even when doctor who was on its peakest peak it was very very rarely the number one most viewed drama of the week when doctor who came back in 2005 with like 10.6 million for rose i think that was kind of the i think that was the viewing figures for the seven days during that time it still was not the number one scripted program of the week it lost out to like two episodes of eastenders and coronation street um i would argue it is not a fact that oh doctor who is doing better now compared to back then because it was losing back then as well i didn't argue that it was doing better i just argued that the metrics and how we judge success has changed over the past 15 or so years like i don't want to interrupt this guy before he's done the whole book because like he's doing that to me so i apologize for doing that to him in turn but like this is an edited video i'm doing a live stream you know it, it, give me a little bit of a break for example, was Doctor Who, when it came back in 2005 in the David Tennant era, was that considered a failure or a flop or whatever because it wasn't besting the late era Tom Baker era? You know, the Graham Williams era with City of Death and Destiny of the Daleks. Destiny of the Daleks to this day is still the most watched Dalek story in terms of the pure viewership who watched it on broadcast. Obviously, that comes with a lot of associated context, but the barometer for success and how you measure success in a TV landscape is going to vary differently based on decade, and it's made even more complicated with the advent of streaming um the quality of tv was much higher. because there were strikes yes and because there was only like one or two channels when we look at stuff like doctor who in the 1980s it was actually doing pretty badly in the broader tv landscape for example you were getting episodes of coronation street and episodes of other dramas and sitcoms and stuff in the late in the mid to late 80s that were getting audience figures of 18 to 20 million people and there's doctor who chugging along on a saturday night with four to five million people watching that was like the ceiling in terms of what was the most watched shows of the week of that time and doctor who was way below it adam martin amtv has broken down the viewing figures over the classic era of doctor who and stories like remembrance of the daleks ranked like 120th for the week that they were broadcast or it was like around the 100 mark for the week that they were broadcast so doctor who being in the top 20 now in the current tv landscape it kind of does show that it's doing better than it was in the 80s, but the barometer for success and what success means changes over the decades. This is a complicated topic to talk about, but you get people like Melon Rattler and, you know, other grifters online and such just failing to comprehend the idea or communicate the idea of this nuance. I back then, and Doctor Who actually had to compete with things. Doctor Who actually had to compete with things of higher quality because the BBC were pumping out things people were watching. Surpass every... Okay, such as, th that's the natural follow-up question here. This is when you would cite a show, and you'd cite why it's good then, and why the BBC is woke now. Like, this is pretty obviously, like, if you were correct here, Melon Rattler, if your position here was actually ironclad, you'd have a fucking open goal here to explain yourself. There's a really interesting book about the genesis of the revival of doctor who the long game 1996 to 2003 the inside story of how the bbc brought back doctor who by paul hayes it's a really fascinating read and it sets the stage for the early 2000s at the bbc where there was basically next to nothing coming out of the drama department they'd had some massive high profile flops in the early in the late 90s to the early 2000s so when doctor who came back in 2005 it was kind of like an open field there there weren't that many big budget family 
genre programs coming out in like between 2003 and 2006 when we saw like the massive boost in genre programming in the mid to late 2000s it was in the slipstream of doctor who primeval beyond human misfits things like that like like i i know that i'm kind of explaining the context to mel and rattler like and explaining the concept to you but there really wasn't much of a actual bbc drama department or bbc popular drama output in the early 2000s doctor who was the trailblazer for that every single episode of coronation street this year in terms of its seven day viewing figures is kind of outstanding we've got the view all right so we're basing the success of Do doctor who's viewing figures to the dwindling figures of coronation street Oh, it's nice to know the standards are very high. Why is it an issue to compare the viewing figures of a show being broadcast contemporarily to what it's broadcasting alongside or next to? Like, is this guy genuinely going to try and argue that comparing viewing figures to comparable viewing figures for time slots and the era that it's being released and promoted and broadcast in is a stupid or bad thing to do? Like, what else are you meant to compare it to? Like apart from obviously the history of the show itself, but that can only te that can only teach you so much. Like this is def yeah, Mench is right in the chat. This is the definition of moving the goalposts. I'm I, what's what's wrong with comparing the viewing figures to what it's currently being broadcast alongside? Genuinely, what's the issue here? He's not presented an actual argument. The figures here. So special one with seven point six one million, special two with seven point one four million, and then special three with six point eight five million. Right, we're going to stop it there. Um, the over seven day figures are a bunch of bullshit. We can see the little viewing figures here, so let's go with the actual numbers. Uh, five when he said bullshit, I assumed he was going to say that these are lies or whatever, some Jewish conspiracy or something. That's typically what I hear when it comes to like, oh, these are fake viewing figures or whatever. Disney has propped up the numbers. I play or fake. I thought he was going for that line of reasoning, but no, he's just dismissing the idea of seven day viewing figures, which, okay, if you want to do that, fair enough. But you also have to do the same for all of like modern TV history, discount the seven day viewing figures, particularly in a post iPlayer and post on demand world. For, to, from my recollection, BBC iPlayer for Doctor Who wasn't even a thing until like 2009. When the 11th hour broadcast, it broke BBC iPlayer records for the most viewed and most streamed show on the brand new service. BBC iPlayer was not a thing for Doctor Who until the late David Tennant era. So if you're going to be discounting the idea of seven day figures and the catch up, you have to do that for the past 15 years of Doctor Who. So is he going to do that? Or is he just annoyed that the seven day viewing figures paint the show in a positive light and he just wants to ignore? Because even by the standards of the overnight viewing figures, it's still charting well. It's still doing well compared to everything being broadcast now. So no matter what happens, this is a bad argument, but he's just discounting this on the premise itself. Do you think that this guy genuinely does this with anything else? Like, for example, does he think that the video game Among Us was a massive bomb? Because when it first was released on, like, PC gaming and Steam and stuff, it wasn't played by many people. But then when lockdown happened, it got a brand new lease on life. Does he think that the film Avatar was a box office bomb? Because in its opening weekend domestically, it only made around $77 million. But then it went on to become the highest grossing film of all time. What's wrong with the idea of, at least for seven days looking at people who were able to watch the show during that time and judging them as part of the audience genuinely what's the issue with that and would you do that with anything else like games like movies or is it just tv or is it just doctor who when you don't like it we're not going to get any of the answers to these questions by the way i'm asking way too much of someone whose brain is literally a fruit 5.0 5.08 million so just tipped over 5 million views for the star beast Wild Blue Yonder lost 200,000 people, 4.83, and lost another 200. Yep, 4%. 1,000 people with 4.62. Fails to mention that, though. Even the dwindling numbers. I don't fail to. I, I mentioned that later on in the video. <laughs> Over the seven days. This is such a cope. I will say, I am genuinely quite surprised that there was a drop with every single episode. Now, I thought that Wild Blue Yonder. Why was there a surprise? Why is there a surprise? <laughs> He's just not going to fucking mention it. He's like, oh, he doesn't bring that up. He never mentions that there's a drop. Never mentioned that. And then fucking the next literal sentence he plays is me mentioning it. And he's just like, 
yeah, but why was there a drop? Like, he doesn't even fucking acknowledge that he was wrong. Like, he plays back-to-back -back sentences contradicting what his own video- And this was an edited video. This is edited. This isn't a live stream. This is back-to-back. -back. And he just left it in. He left it in! <laughs> why is there a surprise with the dwindling numbers? Anyone with a pair of eyes and anyone that doesn't suck off the brand can tell you that these episodes were the biggest piles of shit. Cheap. Cheaply made. <laughs> he sounds like he's gonna cry. But also, like, is this really all you've got to say? Like, Doctor Who, like, it, oh, it looks cheap. It was bad. It was a poopy show. Like, salt. Cheaply made propaganda to try and re educate children into their way of thinking. Russell literally said it with his own fucking mouth. I'm going to play the clip because I'm going to play it in the background. He fucking said it. You can temper that reaction and change it if you introduce these images to people happily and normally and calmly when they're young. I said, I, I told myself I won't get angry at him, but it's just how they, it's annoying how they blindly. Yeah, so, so what's wrong with that? Like genuinely, what's wrong? We've talked about this before, and I doubt Mel and Rattler will play the clip or whatever. But we've talked about this before that it is a sociological phenomenon in terms of like how people engage with the media that they watch, and it's not just for trans people. I mean, that was the clip he's he's clearly taken an issue with Yasmin Finney being in the Star Beast. Like, we're we're seven minutes into this, and this is genuinely, with the exception of cheap special effects, but he's not really elaborated. But whatever, we'll let him have that one if he really wants it. His only argument so far, seven minutes into a 14 minute video, is had a trans person in it, therefore it's propaganda. Like, would he hold this standard to, say, for example, disabled representation or representation of, uh, of, of gay people? or black people, or interracial relationships being depicted on screen, for example. I'm sure that he wouldn't say it, like, well, he might say it, who knows, I don't know. This is like modern day conservatism, they will sometimes just say that. that. You know, you shouldn't depict interracial relationships on TV or whatever. That's 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 another discussion. But like, he's not really said anything, so I guess the idea that it had a trans person in it, and if you have that positive representation, that positive depiction of just a trans person existing in media, or a disabled person just existing in a positive depiction in media, it's fine. Like, what's the issue here? He just seems to just take it umbrage, just take issue with just a trans person being in a piece of media. And that's just kind of what it all boils down to. Pretend, oh, why are people not watching? What could it possibly be? It's probably because the entertainment they're spewing at me is complete shite would be the middle chapter that not that many people saw because it didn't really have that much of a hook. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so I, I actually go on to explain why I think that the Wild Blue Yonder would have had the less viewing figures and why I expected the giggle to do better than Wild Blue Yonder. And I was a bit surprised by that. Like he's taking issue with stuff that I address and talk about at length in the video that he's currently watching. It was very secretive in terms of the marketing. There is no Celestial Toy Maker. There is no Daleks. There's no Cybermen or there's no, you know, Beep the Meep or whatever. It held its cards very close to its chest and there wasn't any sort of, for lack of a better term, a hook. But uh, I would argue people didn't show up because the damage done over the last six years has come back to bite him on the arse and people knew what would happen if they tuned in. I mean, we're talking about Wild Blue Yonder, which, like I said, only had a 4% dip from the Star Beast to Wild Blue Yonder. So yeah, it did lose viewing figures from Star Beast to Wild Blue Yonder, but 4% of an audience, which is quite a marginal tiny drop. Oh, do you think he'll do this with any sort of, like, other TV show? Oh, look at this. We go from Rose with 10.8 million people watching, and now all the way at the bottom, parting of the ways, 6.9 million. Nice. That is a nice figure, but this is like a nearly 40% drop from where it started. I guess that Christopher Eccleston series of Doctor Who was shit, was looked cheap, was propaganda, and it had a trans character in it, and the end of the world is woke, and, you know, you know is he going to say that about Christopher Eccleston series? Or the 11th hour, for example, which starts with 10.09 million, and then the Big Bang ends with 6.7 million. Oh, it's crap. Shit. Like, another 40% drop. Like, the... These are like actual empirical stats that we can look at and we can rationalize it and talk about it in the context of the broader TV shows. But this is like a 40% drop over the course of these episodes. And here's Mel and Rattler getting completely bent out of shape over a 4% drop for one episode to another. It's it, it's not, I'm, for John Stuck's right, or how I just butchered your name, I'm sorry, a 4% drop might not even be st statistically significant. Like it's enough for it to show up in the figures, but it, it, in terms of like, going from one episode to another, it's pretty marginal.
and they would get lectured, not entertained. I, I, but that's my that's my just wild controversy. Like what what was being lectured? What was the lecturing in the specials? Are you gonna like even attempt to argue it? Opinion. But uh, I am angry. Now it's not a big drop from Wild Blue. Oh, did he edit? Opinion. But uh, I am angry. Now it's not. Okay, so he did do an edit. I don't know what he cut out, but it shows that he can edit this video, which which just makes the previous stuff even funnier. Uh, I, I, but that's my that's my just wild controversial opinion. But uh, I am angry. Now it's not a big drop from Wild Blue Yonder. It's only a four percent drop <laughs> from this to this. But still, that's quite surprising. There's, of course, a lot of fat. Surprising. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah, it's surprising. Probably because the first two specials, mate, were fucking shite. I gave the Star Beast a chance. And within 10 minutes, it completely it completely destroyed any form of hope that I had. Once again, he could have edited that out. But he says that he took, he, he took issue with the propagandizing. He took issue with... Yasmin Finney being in the show and Rusty Davis being a you know, lecturing or whatever, but the supposed lecturing or whatever of the Star Beast, you know, the pronoun scene, that's like 30 minutes into the episode and then there's the whole male presenting time lord thing, which for the record, I don't like the male presenting time lord line. I've talked about that in depth in my own video about it, so I'm not, you know, you know, I'm not a shill in terms of that particular woke messaging or whatever, but he says, oh, I gave it a chance, 10 minutes, gave it a chance, but... But Yasmin Finney was in the first few scenes of the episode, so his issue just is trans inclusion. His his issue, from what we can glean from this video, because he's, he's not really putting forward any other argument or any other any other evidence here, is that it just had a trans person in it. That was just the issue with this guy, like f pretty explicitly. It completely destroyed any form of hope that I had left. Yeah, this is of course the. Oh, seven let's hear the facts, mate. Let's hear the. Let's hear the, the coat. This is basically a full arc. This is basically a full run of hour-long episodes, which tend to do really, really well when it comes to the binge model. Once all of the episodes oh, are up, then God. people go and. So he's suggesting if they dropped all the piece of shit at once. That Doctor Who would have been an absolute success. I would argue that drawing out the TV show weekly episodes... I mean, it already was a success going week to week. But we have seen from TV shows like Luther, from uh, Peter Kay's car show... I, I talk about that in this very video from what I remember. But I've definitely talked about it before. TV shows like Luther massively benefited from first episode broadcast on the actual day. And then you can view all of the episodes on the iPlayer. ITV are having a massive success right now with their post office drama as well. Like uh, the first episode will get incredibly strong viewing figures, but the other ones might taper off because people watched it all in one go. The, uh, the Thief, the Man and the Canoe a year or two ago on ITV also benefited from this binge model. Like, th the data's all there. We can look at the empirical BARB figures from BBC and ITV shows that benefit, definitely in the short term at least, for having the bingeable shows all viewable in one go. Th that's what the data says. Does this guy just have an issue with empiricism? And if they're good, keep the buzz going, keep the conversation going. Word of mouth word of mouth gets around hey guys doctor who's back and it's really good and it ain't woke and it ain't preachy because that's that's what exactly <laughs> if someone says to me doctor who ain't woke doctor who ain't preachy i will question whether or not they even watched a doctor who <laughs> like genuinely would have happened if the star beast came out and it was an absolute fucking triumph and it was absolutely amazing shut people like me up and entertained everybody we'd probably be looking at very, very high number viewing figures for Christmas. Boy, this guy. <laughs> Reminder, I know that this video came out before... Actually, no, this video came out on January 3rd, so we did already have the overnight figures, but we didn't have the seven-day figures for The Church on Ruby Road. The Church on Ruby Road, just to remind you folks, was the number one scripted drama on Christmas Day, the very first time Doctor Who has ever held that title. So... It turns out that people watched trans positive Doctor Who, woke Doctor Who, cheap Doctor Who, Disneyfied Doctor Who, whatever, and thought, yeah, it's pretty good. Let's go. Let, let's watch the Christmas special with Shooty Gatwa. Yeah, let's go for it. This guy is genuinely Principal Seymour Skinner in that episode of The Simpsons, where he's like, Doctor Who was a massive success. Am I that out of touch? No, it's the viewers that are wrong. Genuinely, that's this guy. That's the approach he's taken to this. He's a walking parody. He's a walking cartoon. Fucking Mr. Retard says cope is that it wasn't that binge model. What? It wasn't cope. It was just me explaining another avenue that Doctor Who could have taken. I don't know why he's trying to project so much about me coping. Like, I'm just talking about the figures. 
I, 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 I don't. He's he's trying so hard to make this angle sell, but it, in my opinion, it's just not sticking. Oh, this is by the way, this is some of the first time I'm actually hearing his excuses of why this is failing. All right, let's go. Let's go. Hardest to reach category since Line of Duty. I don't know what the source is for this. I have reached out to William to, you know, where did you get this information from? But I'm genuinely like, if this is actually true, this means that Doctor Who's future, at least in terms of the BBC, is secure. Oh, it's secure. The, oh my God. I don't know the source of this information, but I'm going to take it as absolute fact. I don't know the source of this information, but Doctor Who's future is in absolute safe hands. I literally, you played the clip of me saying, if this is true, you played the clip of me giving the qualifying statement. You played the clip. You just, you showed it. With this God. BC, actually, you know, where did you get this information from? But I'm genuinely like, if this is actually true, he played the clip of me saying the qualifying statement, and now he's like, yeah, I'm just going to accept this. The, the, the <laughs> that's genuinely quite audacious. The fact that he plays the clip of me saying it, and then he completely contradicts like what I say a sentence later. That's genuine brain rot. Genuine brain worms. This means that Doctor Who's future, at least in terms of the BBC, is secure. Oh, it's secure. The, oh my God. I don't know the source of this information, but I'm going to take it as absolute fact. I don't- You can edit the video. If you were really trying to push this angle, you could have genuinely edited that bit out. It would have been deceptive and it would have shown you to be a completely dishonest hack. But the fact that you played the clip and still went with this reasoning honestly makes you come across even fucking worse. I don't know the source of this information, but Doctor Who's future is in absolute safe- By the sounds of it, he's not recorded this video separately from the clips and then added the clips in later. He's watching my video live and reacting to it and he's put it together in a video. So he heard me say that qualifying statement and he's just chosen to fucking blitz past it. He's not even listening to what I'm saying. Hands with Disney. Hi, please, please hire me. He doesn't know how to edit. He doesn't know how to fucking listen. His future is in absolute safe hands with Disney. Hi, please, please hire me. Hi, me, BBC. I'm not Hi. even talking about Disney. I was talking about the viewing figures in the UK, which doesn't factor into the Disney Plus distribution model for Doctor Who. And also, I don't have to shit out for the BBC to hire me, okay? They hire me anyway. I'm a freelance TV and film worker. I've done a lot of stuff for ITV. I've done work for Disney. I've done work for the BBC. I've done work for Channel 4 and dozens of channels in between, okay? I don't need to shill. They hire me anyway because I'm good at my freelance job. Me, please. Yeah, the future's in safe hands, but they needed Doctor Who to be an absolute success over in international waters, and that's why it's getting a big budget, mate. That's the fucking reason why it's getting a big push by Disney, because they want it to be an absolute... They want it to be an absolute franchise for them to push, because they're losing every... Fr oh. I don't know if you're paying attention, mate, but Disney are failing. I don't know. Are you paying attention? No, but like, I, I don't really get what this guy's train of thought is here. Like, Disney now have exclusive distribution rights and have put in a bit of additional funding for Doctor Who and Bad Wolf to do the Hooniverse and for the show proper itself. But what's the issue with that? Like, before Disney, uh, streaming services like HBO Max and Netflix paid for the distribution of Doctor Who to stream it internationally. But Disney are just doing that, but they now have an exclusive deal. What What's the issue with this? Like, he, he's not even putting forward an argument here. In every corner, every corner of their own franchises, every single inch, they're losing people by the millions because people have had enough of this bullshit. They just want to be entertained. They're going over, they're going over international waters. They're going to Japanese entertainment to actually be entertained by people. <sighs> Yes, they're going to watch Japanese entertainment, famously apolitical Japanese entertainment. Honestly, I've been on a bit of a Legend of Zelda kick over the festive period. Oh, oh my god, those Zelda games are surprisingly political, especially when it comes to like, the making of them. Majora's Mask, one of my favourite games of all time, really like was inspired by the political, social political events happening at the time. There was a story from the developers developers who were making Majora's Mask. Premise of Majora's Mask is that you are you have to rescue a kingdom and a moon is descending and you have 72 hours to stop this land from being destroyed by a falling moon and you groundhog day it so you're able to go back and forth to try and save the land of Termina before the moon falls. That was inspired by people in Japan, the developers in Japan, currently being under threat from potential rockets from South Korea. So, you know, 
famously politically charged, but also what are some of the biggest exports happening from Japan to the rest of the world right now? Anime and manga. Dragon Ball, which is class conscious, like massive political commentary about nature versus nurture and uh, and monarchies and dictatorial empires with Frieza and stuff like that. And let's not forget One Piece, literally an anime and a manga about revolutionaries trying to take down a world government, which has a trans character, a trans man in its latest arc, its latest massive arc, and it's had huge amounts of success. The reason I'm not getting so triggered about Doctor Who anymore because I fucking found a great show called One Piece. <laughs> does he know how does he know oh my god you couldn't make it up you couldn't make it up oh this story about an outsider maverick who tries to take down topple governments and also has a trans character in its latest story arc oh, i can't have doctor who i'm gonna watch one piece instead oh my god so funny oh my god <laughs> oh my Oh. oh my god. Oh my god. And it's filled that hole in my heart that Doctor Who kind of left. And yeah, whatever. I talk about Doctor Who now because it is still kind of therapeutic. <sighs> and idiots like this get a fucking nibble out of me, but you know. Oh, uh, the future Doctor Who, by the way, he says it's in safe hands. This show will be cancelled within three years. I'll put fucking. I'll put. I'll, if this cunt wants to reach out to me, I'll put how much ever money on the line. I'll put. I'll put anything on the line. It will be fucking dead in three years. Shooting Gatto is the last doctor. It'll be dead. Disney will fucking can this shit. Because they can't afford to put. The, they can't afford to put shit on their live subscription service anymore. It's not going to happen. How much, mate? Reach out to me. Reach out to me, bro. 100 quid. Three years' time. The show's gone. 16 to 30. Okay, it's the 8th of January 2024. If Doctor Who has not been cancelled by the 8th of January 2027, Melamala, I'll take you up on that. If it has been cancelled within the next three years, as in there's no more Doctor Who taken off the air, Doctor Who's gone, whatever, BBC aren't making it, it's gone, cancelled. Even if it's on hiatus or whatever, okay. Um, if it is cancelled in three years' time, Melon Rattler, I will donate £100 to a charity of your choosing. If it is still going on, on the 8th of January 2027, I would like you to donate £100 to the Mermaids charity, a trans charity in the UK. £100. 34 demographic. Is the youths, is the TikTokers, is the millennials or the young millennials? I would argue you shouldn't be focusing on the millennials and the TikTokers, and you should be focusing on the fans, the people that have been here. Firstly, millennials and TikTokers can also be fans. That's a demographic of the show that you can appeal to, of course. Like, but also, let's not... Take, okay, I let him finish the point. I, I, I let him finish the point. Yeah, for 60 years, you fucking dimwit. Locked in. To be <laughs> he didn't even make a fucking point. Okay, one of the reasons Doctor Who did have a slow decline in the 1980s was because it became very fan wanky. The people who grew up with the show in the 1960s and the 1970s got the keys to the kingdom and started making shows that were steeped in continuity. You know, Attack of the Cybermen, which is a sequel to Tomb of the Cybermen, which in the 1980s was a lost story. Every single story of season 20. And almost all of the Sixth Doctor's run had aspects of the show's continuity laced into it. Um, from Gallifrey to the Master uh, to the inclusion of the Rani. I think, what not it Vengeance on Varos and Time Lash are the only Sixth Doctor stories that were broadcast that don't have a tie-in to previous continuity. There was such fan-wanky stuff in the Sixth Doctor's era that in order to include the Second Doctor and Jamie, it, it broke the canon so hard that they had to create se Season 6B. You know... If, you if you're wanting pandering fan wanky stuff, because sometimes the fans don't really know what they want or what makes for a good show. And I put myself in that camp as well. Sometimes I don't know what would make for good Doctor Who in the moment without the benefit of hindsight. But, of course, there are many demographics that you can lean to. But one thing that Russell T. Davis makes a priority, and uh, you can just watch The Church on Ruby Road as well for further proof of this, is that he is a populist writer. He writes stuff that gets into, like, the current social political climate. Stuff about, you know, whether it be um, things like Years and Years, whether it be shows like It's a Sin, and also Doctor Who as well. You can see the all the populist inclusions from his time in Doctor Who in 2005 onwards as well.
So obviously you can make shows for the fans, whatever the hell you define that term to be. But if you don't reach out to that every so often as well, you are going to have a dying show. And we saw this happen in the 80s supporters of the bbc and people who pandering to fans is why half of the disney films so yeah yeah that's it he, he was he was bad mouthing disney earlier for trying to be pandering for fans and continuity and stuff like that so this guy genuinely doesn't really know what he wants not to pay the license fee it makes no sense why conservatives keep saying recipe song because it doesn't make any sense it doesn't have to make any sense they they're putting the narrative first and are trying to post hoc justify their reasoning after the fact uh, so rest, uh, the reason rest in peace Doctor Who is trending is because people who have been fan uh, fans for this of this franchise for a number of years, people like myself, um, can go back and have evidence of how good this show used to be at every level. Whereas sound design, production, storytelling, acting. Yes, let's look at the famous production values of Doctor Who, a show that has never ever looked cheap in its history. Let's let's go back in time to the early 1980s for a story called Warriors of the Deep, a story which explicitly is about Cold War tension, so obviously nothing political there, but this is the Doctor Who that Melon Rattler wants to save. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you folks, but I would take the Star Beast over this, personally. I can only speak for myself, okay? I can, o I can only speak for myself. What were we talking about? <laughs> what were we talking about? They can look at all these things because they have actual evidence to look at. Um, like, let's say, for example, go back and watch Rose. Compare that to these three specials. Which is better? And why? For me, I'd say Rose is about on par with the Star Beast. Maybe Rose is a little bit better, but Rose is not as good as Wobbly Yonder. Rose is not as good as the Church on Ruby Road, in my opinion. But of course, it's it's a different thing as well. It's a different show. It's nearly 20 years ago Rose was broadcast. God's sake, stop living in the past, Melon Rattler. It takes a bit of critical thinking to maybe figure out the reason why it's better, or which one is better. The current stuff is shite because the ideologues in charge in charge don't care about being creative and don't care about entertaining russell t davis doesn't care about bringing doctor who back he's using it as a little fucking platform to show how much of an ally he is and idiots like this just want to fucking harm the show even more because they want to hang on to his fucking coattails to get a job even if you didn't like the joke I, i'm waiting for him to actually start explaining like giving specific examples or actually talking about it obviously it's all going to be subjective if he prefers rose and early rusty davis as opposed to what's happened in the 60th anniversary specials then he's more entitled to that opinion but he's not arguing anything and not putting anything forward like genuinely he's not doing it era the viewing figures were still relatively strong compared to other dramas that are broadcasting around the viewing figures for jody whittaker's era were strong <laughs> i'm gonna leave this cunt's video so he he's gonna do the nerdrotic thing he's just going to play a clip and not even bother to have an argument or dis to disprove it. Like I said, I say it in this video, I don't know if he'll play the clip. The only episodes of the Jodie Whittaker era that I think can be called bad in terms of like the viewing figures in the audience was The Timeless Children and Legend of the Sea Devils. The rest is pretty good for what was being broadcast around the time. Obviously, it's not as the highs of the David Tennant era or the highs of the early Matt Smith era, but it was still doing pretty well in terms of the broader drama landscape. Doctor Who is very rarely the top dog, as I show in this video that he's responding to but he's just not having it he's just not bothering to respond or engage critically in any sort of way from this point because he's going back in time and suggesting oh doctor who didn't win it didn't win it wasn't the number one viewing figure look i didn't say that it didn't win i just said that the parameters for success are different like and define winning like being the just the only way to win is to be the number one scripted drama of the that's not the only barometer for success it's just a barometer for success but it's not the only one and even then success is relative like he's not even bothering to engage critically at those numbers 11.57 million only just losing out to eastenders but again this is the time when i don't like the bbc but well, these are the times where the BBC were putting entertainment ahead of ideology. Because they understood. Such as, in what way you're going to even bother to substantiate this point? Understood 
they needed a fucking audience to continue their production. He is coping so unbelievably hard, he is trying to suggest this is a failure. I, no, I, I didn't at any point. No. They, they, they didn't win back then. No, this is a win. This is a win. I it didn't... Should... I don't even think I used the word win in the original video. I think he... What? What's he projecting here? Tigatwa had 11.57 million on his opening episode at Christmas Day, but still lost out to EastEnders and the Royal Family. It, it, still, it still would have been a win. That's 11 million people. All in all, Mr. Tardis. Oh, so wait. So now he's looking at the seven-day viewing figures, but earlier he was saying that seven-day viewing figures are lies and they're stupid and you shouldn't be following this. He can't... Like, this is, like, over the course of one video. Like, genuine, like, brain stupidity, brain worms. He's got worms in his brain. I'm glad I blocked him on Twitter, which apparently was his origin story. <laughs> his Joker moment. Is a fucking retard. See, I have numbers. I have statistics. I have the facts and data on my mind, as well as, you know, you can argue whether or not they're good arguments or not, but at least I actually have arguments. But apparently it all falls in the face of Mel and Rattler calling me a retard. Okay. And likes to block anyone on Twitter that doesn't agree with him. I'd love to see him debate someone who actually loves the show and doesn't just shill it out for a fucking job application like he's doing. He's on the fucking floor begging for Russell T. Davis to give him a job behind the scenes. And the, the video just fucking ends. I was waiting for it to wrap up, but I, I think his, his brain just broke mid-sentence and the video just ends. And that's just it. That's the video ending. <laughs> oh, God. Right, comment section, comment section. Um, standing ovation. You are speaking for most of us classic Who fans who hate... Standing ovation. He didn't even fucking say an argument doesn't even say that's how low the bar is the threshold is to be a conservative on youtube how fucking low the bar is miss harris does good reviews of the episode especially the class series but it's quite a blind spot about anyone just likes the current story did he watch my review of the star beast like i wasn't wholly positive on it i'm definitely not wholly positive on my review of the giggle you know that comes out late in a few days time patreon.com forward slash trilby you can watch my review of the giggle there it's hilarious how Mr. Tyus will contort himself into an ideological pretzel to cope hard and deny the shit racism. Ideological pretzel. This, we've seen nothing but ideological pretzels and gymnastics from this guy over the course of these 14 minutes. Jesus Christ. Oh my God. Peakest peak. Can't even think of another adjective like highest peak or loft. Firstly, I am streaming. I am improvising. But also, peakiest peak has alliteration, so therefore it's good. Oh, yeah, cause problem beings here. Mr. Turgic and yes, Snowman. <laughs> oh, no Zone's here as well. God, rip the, the dumbest people hate me. It's so vindicating that the people who dislike me the most are the ones who are the absolute stupidest and will accept these folks as their champions. The <laughs> right, let's have a look. What else has Mel and Rattler said? Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Uh, Mega Rusty Day. Okay, so Yasmin Finney's in the thumbnail, so of course it's just trans stuff. GTA reaction. Okay, you can tell why this guy does these types of videos. Because five days and this video has been seen by over 4,000 people. Which honestly is pretty good engagement. But also, his review of Godzilla Minus One saying it was incredible. 165 views in three weeks. That's pretty sad. And it, and I, I don't mean that in like a sad, oh, sad for you, you know. In a, in a sort of like genuinely quite sad way that it shows how YouTube sort of promotes the negativity. Like this guy's like, oh, this is a piece of media that I really liked. I'm sure it wasn't political. It's only a fucking Godzilla movie. But, you know, uh, another non-political story to come from Japan, of course, Godzilla. But yeah, positivity gets less than 200 views. But calling me a retard and a pretzel knot of arguments of stupidity for over 4,000 views. Yeah. What else we got? Yasmin. Oh, I've seen this. Okay, I've already watched this video. Yasmin Finney's a national treasure. So this guy must have put uh, gone in my um, in my recommended, and I watched it. Um, oh, David Tennant is a groomer. So this guy is talking about cope. Is talking about denying reality from me, but he appears to be calling David Tennant a pedophile. Let's have a look. Well, it's happened. This is it. This is the fucking nail in the coffin for this franchise. Days after 
I reported. Okay, the politics for you Twitter account. David Tennant responds to backlash against pro trans t shirt. Uh, it was a t shirt that says, Leave trans kids alone, you absolute freaks. Uh, he wore this on the press circuit in like uh, during summer. Um, and his response to the backlash was, quote, I'll be fine. Turfs can't climb stairs and I still have my sonic screwdriver. Pedo has been outed at the BBC and we still don't know who the fuck this is, by the way. My personal childhood hero. This guy, for me... I can't put into words. Fake quote. Yeah, I think that was a fake quote because it's Politico for you. It's not politics for you. This turned out to be a fake quote. This wasn't true. This was a fake quote. It just got circulated. It was just very funny. How important and how how much this actor David Tennant did for me when it came to Doctor Who, my personal favorite science science book. this guy is calling david tennant a pedophile with no evidence and not only that a fake quote obviously the shirt is real but the quote is fake after Chris what's a turf trans exclusionary radical feminist but it's a bit of a oxymoron term there's no such thing as a feminist who is anti-trans for eccleston left after uh i was a I, I can't remember how old i was now this is before everyone knew the insides of the show and i was kept away from all the backstage stuff so it was surprising to me when he regenerated and turned into this guy when number 10 showed his face i remember i remember watching the christmas invasion the first reply to that tweet to be fair that's what twitter does another childhood hero is fucking dead to me what a grooming pandering freak heartbroken never meet your heroes but once again this is a fake quote real shirt fake quote and this guy is like yeah he's a grooming pedophile and, and david only... tennant's a groom i hope david tennant well david tennant was is represented at the same agency as graham linehan who was the completely gone off the deep end transphobe who used to write the it crowd and um and uh, father ted and he called david tennant a pedophile and because um he's at the same agency as david tennant the agency dropped him and graham linehan and graham linehan was like oh no he just didn't like my arguments he didn't say an argument he just called david tennant a pedophile and then was dropped by his agency in love with this incarnation of the doctor straight away talented actor absolutely incredible i've never doubted his abilities i've always been a fan of him. i'm gonna just up the speed here real quick this guy is, is so on the in the throes of grief is so on the verge of tears he's talking very slowly and i was always surprised that he never made it further i'm surprised he never shot into superstardom because this dude he can act he's got talent Buckets and buckets of talent. I remember it, it, it could go from being the likable, charming hero to the ugly, disgusting, menace villain that we've seen in other shows. Like. Melamela, have you considered that you are the actual problem here? That it's actually you being the issue here? Because all of the polling and the data that we have in the UK, even though it's Turf Island, shows that it's a minority of people who are anti-trans. The vast majority of people in the UK, about 60 to 70%, sometimes 75% depending on the polling, are either pro-trans or are indifferent to trans people. So... You know, maybe you are the one who is out of touch. You are the principal Seymour Skinner who is out of touch and blaming everybody else for being wrong. And then to top it all off, your brain worms are so insidious, are so buried deep inside of your little brain that you are getting bent out of shape and calling David Tennant a pedophile because of a fake joke tweet, a thing that he didn't even fucking say. Get me out of here. Get me out of this segment. Genuine parody. Couldn't fucking make it up. Genuine joke of a person. An actual man-child. Once again, I am further vindicated by the fact that my biggest opponents, my biggest, most outspoken critics, are just the dumbest people going. And the most hateful people going with no arguments.